Welcome to the UUC Talk Show. In this show, we introduce you to the most interesting people with the most interesting ideas from the U of I campus. Today, we have a very special guest. His name, Jaden David Tansom. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good to Good see afternoon. you as always, on David. What do you do today? What I do today? Um, bit of a slow start to the morning, but I ended up waking up, getting some food, and just working on homework for the day. Tell us more about you know who you are, where you come from. Just you know, just quickly, just a little rundown of your life. Sure, a little rundown of my life. So. I'm Jaden Thompson. Um, I'm currently a sophomore in mechanical engineering. Um, but before coming to the U of I, um, I, I kind of grew up all around the world. So my dad works for an oil and gas company. So um, I've lived in California, Florida, Jakarta, Indonesia, Singapore, and also Houston, Texas. So very unique childhood, getting the opportunity to see different places. Um, and yeah, that's that's what I was doing before I got to U of I. You know, something I found really interesting about you is that you really have these interesting obsessions in a, in a way that most people don't. So what do you explore in the evenings, in the weekends? Like what obsession do you explore in these times? Interesting. Um, bit of a, a question before that. What makes you say I have these obsessions? Give me some examples. Well, because I've seen you. So a, a little bit of background here. So. Jed in here, he wanted to get into the in run with the track uh, team. And unfortunately, the, the guy didn't want to let, let you in, even though you had the time and you were definitely clearly competent to even win titles and, and you know make a good effort. And if you're watching this right now, you know, maybe think about it twice. But you were really committed to that. I don't know how you were running like 10 mile like runs and like you were really up. That happened, and then you still were very obsessed in the sense that you switch, and now you became a boulder. Boulder is that is that what it yeah. is? Yeah. So sure. And you literally you've been going there probably since you since since the track people told you no that I know of probably more than fifty times or, or around so. So to me, you, that's clearly. An obsession you're doing it because you want to like 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 no one is telling you like oh if you do this you're gonna get money or you're gonna become famous you are doing it because you like it and i don't really see that often that you're like oh i'm just gonna jump i'm just gonna do this and because i really like it i'm gonna do it really intensely and really following what you want to do hmm. okay i would i would say you're right there um i guess i can speak a little more on the track situation and um even before that so for as long as I can remember, I've always really enjoyed just like being physically active. Um, so when I was younger, um, I really enjoyed cycling, skateboarding. I remember when I lived in California, um, California is pretty hilly. If you've ever been, um, in my neighborhood had a bunch of hills. So I'd ride, um, multiple like circuits of the neighborhood every day. Um, then that kind of transitioned into me getting more into soccer and that became my main pastime. Um, but then when I moved to Jakarta, Indonesia, um, things didn't work out the way I would have liked. Didn't manage to make the team. Um, I ended up playing on, on the B team in one of the leagues and I felt like I was looked over. The team wasn't very serious and I'd look at the A team and, and feel like I could contribute there. Um, so unfortunately I kind of put it close to track or sorry, to soccer. Um, before that I had also played lacrosse growing up, but lacrosse is a tricky sport to play around the world because it's depending on a lot of equipment and it's improving now, but it's it's somewhat of an affluent sport. So that was another avenue that was shut down. Then I played basketball. Always enjoyed playing basketball, but I realized it's something I enjoy more playing, you know, pick up with friends as opposed to an organized league. Right. Um, and then from there, I, I had some challenges with my knees. Um, a lot of people get like growing pains, um, specifically like Oscar Slider disease, which sounds a little more serious than it is. I think like 60% of preteens end up getting it. Um, but that put a, a bit of a wrench in terms of me being able to, to play other sports. And so my freshman year, I decided that I would just run track and field, stay active, meet some friends. 
And over the course of of that season, I met um, a really talented junior on the team. His name was Timo Fukar. And then I met another freshman, uh, Joe Duffy. And the three of us started running. I went from hating running because in most sports it's a punishment to um, really enjoying it. Not because I, I liked the running itself, but because of the time with um, Timo and Joe and, and all the other things that came along with it. And so when I came to the U.S., I was really expecting, you know, top-notch competition. Um, when I was running in Jakarta, it was challenging because um, track isn't a huge sport there. And so the international school that I went to only really had two meets. And for both of them, you traveled internationally to compete against five, you know, big other international teams in the region. Um, but, you know, looking on the Internet, I'd always see all oh, the American kids are running really fast back in the <laughs> States. And so that summer we moved to Houston. I ran every single day. Um, I ran alone. I kept pushing my mileage because I was convinced I was going to step on the team and, you know, be surrounded by the greatest high school runners I could imagine. Um, lo and behold, the team wasn't very good. Didn't have a lot of runners. Um, but that obsession, as you described it, ended up helping me. And over the course of my three years in Houston, I went from just running and enjoying it as a sport to really taking it seriously to eventually kind of leading on the team and coaching it. And um, then I got dreams of running in college. Um, as you, you described, didn't work out the way I wanted. Some coaching changes, some, um, I guess, over overestimates of, of the ease of it on my part and, um, you know, m mistakes that I would, I would say I made and also just unfortunate circumstances. Um, but regardless of, of what doors I feel have been opened or closed, you know, I always find something that I really enjoy. And I think especially as a university student, you know, having a pastime like rock climbing or like painting or whatever it is for you is an important obsession. So we have a long winded response to why I'm obsessed with things, but um, I guess little obsessions drive me. And, uh, you know, if I'm struggling with some homework, at least I can look forward to it. I'm going to go climbing with Rhea and Neil later, or I'm going to go on a run, something like that. But they just don't drive you. They really, really drive you. So I remember one time last year, I had this friend, not not really friend, but like a guy I talked to and asked questions. And so I'm an economist. His name is Tyler Cowan. And I emailed him, hey, what were you thinking when you were my age? Like, what were you thinking when you were in college? And he replied, he told me, hey, I really wasn't thinking about these questions, about like what I want to do with my life or anything. He said, quote, I quote, I mostly just pursue my obsessions. Hmm. And in his case, he, he was actually, he was like number one in chess team in the university. Wow. And then he, just, he, went, he went to become an economist. And I think he probably would have gone into Harvard and all these colleges. And he, he decided to go to George Mason because he wanted to have more time and do the work stuff. So he decided to go to George Mason and he ended up going to Harvard after that. But the point of the story is that he said, hey, I just mostly pursue my obsessions. And then he goes, I just hope everything would turn out okay. And for him, obviously that, but you have something that I find really interesting because they like, they don't like, they just don't like drive you. They really, really drive you. And in a lot of these things, you may say, oh, like perhaps there isn't really like a, an angle. And I think for a lot of us, especially in college and especially like in this globalized like world, everyone's thinking like, oh, like what's the best thing I can do right now with my time? Like what's the most productive thing with the most return and like everything? But turns out that the, the most productive thing you can do is what you actually want to do with your obsessions. And I think that maybe has to do with because you, you spend so much time in, in different people, different worlds, and, and I think it definitely change, change your perspectives. So how do you think, and especially the, the time that you live in, in, in Jakarta. So how do you think living in Jakarta, which again, different culture from the one that you might have experienced growing up in the US. How do you think growing up, or how do you think growing up in, the, in Jakarta change how you see your obsessions? Hmm. That's a, that's a tough question, but I think that's something I've thought about a fair bit myself. Um, before Jakarta, I, I'd say my life was pretty simple. And to preface this, you know, I, I didn't have some life changing event. I didn't get attacked <laughs> by a lion. You know, Jakarta wasn't like some war zone that I went into, but it was definitely an adjustment. And I went from, you know, having a close set of friends that I knew from like third grade 
Um, you know, I had a, a, a team for soccer that I played with for many years. And a lot of things were comfortable. Um, and I, I just felt very comfortable in California. And upon moving to Jakarta, I realized like this was just very, very different. Um, even before we got there, it took like six months for us to get a work permit. And I remember, I think it was end of sixth grade. You know, I told all my friends, like, it was, it was great seeing you. Um, it's been nice, but I'm going to be gone next year. I'm going to be in Jakarta. And some of them said, really? You're going to Africa? <laughs> oh, my goodness. But, you know, anyways, I told all these people I was going to be gone. And first day of seventh grade, and I'm in their classroom again. And they must have thought, oh, he's a scam artist. <laughs> um, but even just getting to Jakarta took a while. And once I got there, I realized it was very, very different. Um, just in terms of, of, I guess, the infrastructure, it's very, very dense city. Um, there's a lot of motorcycle traffic, a lot of traffic in general. Um, and so it, it changed the way we had to live. Um, I had less freedom. I couldn't just, you know, bike around my neighborhood. I couldn't just walk across the street and have like six huge soccer fields. Um, in terms of getting outside and doing things that I really enjoyed, it wasn't as easily accessible um, just because of the density. Um, I didn't know people. That was another major challenge. Um, I made some friends my first first semester, um, but I quickly realized that the school culture was something I wasn't used to. Um, as I kind of touched on earlier, there's not a lot to do um, in Jakarta besides go to the mall or go clubbing, you know, at least for the international students. Um, and so I walked into this environment where it felt like um, everything that everybody was doing just just didn't fit with me. Um, and the things that I wanted to do, like play soccer, weren't available. Partly because I, I guess I just wasn't good enough um, and also because of unforeseen things. And so I ended up spending a lot of time just alone um, trying to figure out ways to entertain myself. I think I ended up buying a BMX bike and I tried to teach myself um, how to do BMX because I saw it on YouTube and it looked easy. Um, I, I bought a cheap drone and had some fun flying that around. Um, I did some Lego robotics at a class and just a bunch of random hobbies. And I realized that. You know, I couldn't just sit in, you know, kind of well away in my room. Um, if I felt like I was bored, I'd have to do something to entertain myself. Um, and I also realized like, okay, maybe the, the first friends I met weren't the best friends for me, but I can still put myself out there and make friends. And so I think Jakarta in many ways pushed me to um, get out of my comfort zone and just develop. Um, in terms of being a little more outgoing, um, I think it really grew my faith. Um, and in terms of, of, you know, me really pursuing faith on my own and I had a great youth pastor and a great youth program that I went to and I had a lot of fun there. I ended up helping make videos for the church every week. And so that was something that, that gave me, you know, a little bit of purpose, even when I didn't have a lot of friends or I got cut from the soccer team or whatever it may be. So I think being put in that situation of discomfort gave me a lot of time to pursue really random hobbies that have grown and become bigger parts of my life. And again, I also find it interesting as well because you have your beliefs and you are able to stick with them. Like you know what you want and you are able to sort of like go against the world or or, or as you may seem when you were in sixth grade. For, for instance, when you didn't have a lot of friends, I think a lot of people would have been like, oh, like they're doing that. I probably should just be doing them to like, not be lonely in my room. Well, like you were mm. willing to be lonely in your room. Of course, it didn't mean like, you know, like, I'm not going to be with those people anymore. I'm always going to be mm. in my room. Like, you still try and like find different people. But at first, like the first stuff for many people would be like, you know, most people are doing this. You don't want to fit in. I may as well, you know, do that. I don't want to do it, but mm -hmm. it's okay. I just want, just one time. I mean, you, one time turns, you know, 10 times, whatever. Right. Yeah. So, And, and, and I think it's interesting because, like, how do you think, um, because, like, these beliefs, right, that you, that you have, you're able to have them and, like, you know, hold them really strong. So if you had to advise someone in making friends, like, making friends that you, like you said, like, that, that, that you fit and, and that you like being with and, and that have a similar value, similar, similar beliefs, what would you say to that person? Mm. That's an interesting question. Um, I think it can feel very hard to separate your beliefs from other parts of your life or someone else's beliefs from other parts of their lives. Um, 
but you don't always have to do that. Now, I think, you know, your, your most fundamental beliefs about life, existence, God, etc. Those are all very crucial questions that I think everybody has to search for. Um, but you can also have, you know, your beliefs and people can have others and you can still be friends with them. Um, and so, you know, when I got to Jakarta, I realized, well, some of these people are drinking like middle school, like going like clubbing, all this craziness that you would never imagine. Um, and at first it was a big turnoff and, um, you know, I had never really seen that. And so I think it, it, it was a huge shock to me. And maybe to some degree, I, I became a little self-righteous. Why are they doing that? They're, you know, that's bad for them. I shouldn't do that. Um, but, you know, by the end of my time, some of those people were, were good friends of mine. And, you know, they did things that I wouldn't do and I did things that they wouldn't do. Um, but we could still have a good friendship. I could still talk to them about a lot of things. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in placing yourself around people that disagree with you um, or, or just people that are searching for the same answers that you are. I remember a few weeks ago, I was at uh, some friends' apartments and we stayed up until like 3 a.m., right? We were discussing God and, and religion and science. And uh, we watched some Jubilee videos and we were talking <laughs> about the current state of society. Um, and it was a lot of fun. And that's one of my one of my strongest memories I've made so far. Um, and there is immense value in surrounding yourself with people that, you know, aren't just like yes people. Um, it's, it's very hard to have a deep discussion with yourself sometimes. So, yeah, it's good to put yourself around different people. Right. And I, and I think you might look at it that way because you may, you may be thinking like a, like a scientist, like, like you want to know what's true. And I feel like I do think about it that way, but I think um, sometimes people just don't care. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's something as well as you understand. Like, it's okay if people want to think about it like differently. So, you know, I wonder, because you really had the, 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 this conversation, so I'm sure you have some interesting answers. What's something you believe that most people think is the same? Something I believe most people think is the same. Um, I think the obvious answer is is my faith. Um, I'm a Christian, and I, I think that's a term you hear quite often in the U.S. Um, and I guess my experience has been that, you know, when people say they're a Christian, the perception is, okay, I go to church. Um, maybe I pay ties to the church. Maybe I, you know, volunteer. I'm, I'm a good person. But when you break down Christianity to its fundamental beliefs, it is absurd. Um, it is, you know, the idea that you believe in, in an all-powerful God, a God that, that cares about you, that cares about humanity. Um, you believe in sin. You believe in, in righteousness. And you believe that a man named Jesus walked on the earth, did miracles, died, and rose from the grave. Um, I think that sounds pretty absurd. And sometimes I wake up and marvel that it's something that I believe in. Um, but it is. I, I have my own my own personal reasons. I, I've done some research. I can't say I've looked into every part of Christianity to assess its truthfulness. But I try my best. I think if you believe in something, you should believe in it because you're convinced it's true. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd say that's something that I believe in that is a little bit tricky to explain sometimes. Um, you know, there's there's a guy in the Bible, Paul, who was um, originally a persecutor of Christians. Um, he had a vision and he ended up founding um, many of the early churches. And you read that story and like, oh, that sounds like someone made that up. <laughs> um, it, it seems absurd, but I think there are a lot of absurd things that we all believe. Um, and just because something isn't, I guess, something that you're used to, it doesn't mean that it's true. Or it doesn't mean that it's wrong um, or that it's true. Yeah, I, I heard, I don't remember who said this, but someone said it once that the most, like the most faithful people are the one who, who questions the most. And like for instance, like an atheist, right? They don't question. Like they just believe that it doesn't, like nothing exists. While someone who, who believes, they question, okay, is this true or why is this? And then they find the, their answer, like they find their answers. While like you know, the atheists like uh, they just know it doesn't exist, so they don't, they don't even question. Like they don't even have the, they don't even like that opportunity to to ask themselves, "Oh, is this a thing?" It's just completely out of their 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 minds. Maybe, but 
I'd also say I, I know a lot of atheists that probably know the Bible better than than a lot of Christians or that know the Quran better than a lot of Muslims. So I think in anything there is a wide spectrum. Um, likewise, I can I can say that I've met Christians that are Christian because their parents were and their grandparents were, and they were taken to church on Christmas and on Easter. Um, so so faith in anything, whether it's a religious sense or maybe it's even things that you study in school, um, it's a complicated thing, right? I'm a mechanical engineer. And one thing that I really enjoy about engineering at times, it's like we're not obsessed with everything. You know, I'm taking solid mechanics right now. And there are a lot of things that you can dive into. But one thing that we just recently learned is like, with you know, deflections and, and beams or something, you can just assume small rotations and get rid of a bunch of trick. And it's really nice to be able to simplify things. Um, you can go throughout your life and look into every single crevice of information possible. Um, but that's a bit unrealistic and it doesn't always make things better. Um, and so I think that one of the challenges of life is figuring out what do you really need to dive into and what can you just accept that maybe you're wrong on, but, but, but move forward regardless. So, yeah. Because if, if you question everything, you're not even, like, you're not going to be able to make you move it. If you don't question, if you question nothing, you're just basically just going to like whatever people tell you to, to do or not do. But I do think part, like a big part of our society is around beliefs. Mm -hmm. And I would say that Christianity, for example, is deeply ingrained in, in, in Western thoughts. In, in yes, Western. I would, I would agree with that. And, you know, whether you believe or not, it's just a thing. And it is really ingrained in our, in, in our society. So, and, you know, I, I know that, that, you, that you study the Bible and everything. What are some things that people seem to have, you know, like, regardless of whether you're like, religious or not, like, what are some, like, what's, like, what's been the best piece of, like, like scripture or, like, a lesson that really stuck with you that, that if, you, if you're able to somehow share it to your friends or, or a lot of people, it would really help them? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, one passage that comes to mind is is First Corinthians thirteen. I can't quote it all, but it speaks a lot about love and and what exactly love is. Um, but I, I think another verse that comes to mind is it's out of the New Testament. I, I can't remember it's which which gospel it's in, but it's Jesus saying, "I came not to bring peace, but a sword." Um, it seems a little edgy, right? <laughs> but um, I think sometimes we're very concerned with bringing, um, you know, peace and, and bringing comfort, but comfort can be very destructive. And this is something I've been thinking about in my own life. Like, I get really comfortable with things and it makes me lazy. Um, it makes me complacent. Um, when I'm comfortable, it's easy to like overlook what other people are struggling with, overlook suffering, overlook all of these things. Um, and I think it would be so great if people could not focus on having peace brought to them, but, you know, maybe a, a sword of righteousness or, you know, just just the idea that, you know, comfort isn't the be all end all pursuit in the world. There are more things important. And sometimes to get to those end goals, you have to be uncomfortable um, and you have to question things that you don't want to question. And you have to accept things about yourself, about life that you don't want to accept. Um, and that's a really hard thing to do. Um, and I, I know that's something that I struggle with quite a lot. Um, especially when it comes to like these, these core beliefs about Christianity. Um, when you look in the New Testament, in, in the book of Acts and the early church, the way the church functioned back then seems very different to the way it's, it's structured and runs now. Um, uh, you, you can, you know, read up historical stories of, you know, plagues throughout the Roman world. And when people were fleeing cities because of the high density and the high rates of transmission, you know, there were Christians that were going in, knowingly finding these people that were infected, um, but staying with them until the, the end of their lives to try and, you know, bring bring comfort, to bring peace to them, to, to, to satisfy their needs, even if they knew that they were going to die and they'd probably get infected in the meantime. Um, and then I fast forward now and look at my life and think, you know, would I be willing to do that? And there are a lot of days where I would answer no. 
I, I probably wouldn't. Um, because sometimes I, quite often, frankly, I think I place comfort above more important things in my life. Um, and, and so again, you know, if you believe in something, you should believe in it because it's true. And if I believe in, in the validity of the gospel, if I believe in, um, the, the truth of the Bible, then, you know, I shouldn't place comfort first. I should, I should really challenge myself to, to live in a way, um, that's different. You know, I always think about questions like that, like, you know, doing, doing, like 200 years ago, slavery used to be a bad thing. I mean, yeah, a good thing. <laughs> a good <laughs> thing. <not> anymore. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, in, in the sense of like, you know, people hire slaves, a normal yeah. thing, like slaves was basically like having cars. You know, a lot of, you know, people who were like, quote unquote, important, they have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds because it was a part of, it was, it was mm -hmm. an asset in yeah. a way. And of course, we look back at that and how could you ever do that? How, how, how is it mm -hmm. possible? Like, are you even moral? But at the time, so people were like, no, that's actually completely moral because we're bringing these people from Africa. And of course, I'm paraphrasing. I'm not, I'm not, mm -hmm. But yeah, we're, like, we're bringing these people from Africa and we're giving them better lives. And, and, and you know, some people had like, you know, if you work certain, some, like, some years, I'll give you freedom, whatever, stuff like that. But again, we look at that and how could you ever do that? Mm -hmm. So what are some things that we're doing right now that in a hundred years, two hundred years, five hundred years, we're gonna look back and we're gonna say, "What the hell were you doing?" Hmm. That's a good question. Um, might not be the most qualified person to answer this, but one thing that comes off the top of my head would probably be consumerism. Um, um, you know, there are a lot of current like societal trends with, you know, fighting climate change. Um, you know, helping improve, um, you know, economic hierarchies and, you know, the distribution of wealth and whatnot. But I think a lot of solutions are sold as things that are, are sold, right? They're, they're things you have to buy, right? When you look at, um, you know, a lot of these current trends in terms of living a greener life, it feels like a lot of things are being sold to you. Like, okay, to reduce waste, you should buy this better car or you should buy this, you know, piece of clothing that was recycled. Um, and I think in the U.S. we have an absurd obsession with consumerism. And I find it in my life a lot. Um, I'm, I'm a member of, of Illini Motorsports. It's, it's the best car team on campus. I'm sorry. Um, and we got these really sick team jackets. Um, and they're really nice. Um, I was thinking like, man, this is, this is a nice jacket. I should have gotten a second one <laughs> just to have a second exactly. one, even though there's no need for me to have a second jacket with the same logos, the same sponsors, even if it looks super fly. Um, and yeah, so I think that's something we'll look back in a few years um, and, and think that we were insane as a society to just spend so much money and buy so many things. Um, but it's, it's hard to stop when it's something that you can afford to do. And it seems to make your life more comfortable. Which I you know, I, I would say actually that you said that you know comfort is actually uh it you know like you try to you know comfort could be damaging to your life. Mm -hmm. And I would even say that comfort might be into it because we're doing this thing to make ourselves comfortable. And and like you said, consumerism and consumers is a huge part of the economy, actually 70%. So imagine if we're like now we're like, we're not going to buy more jackets. And actually, mm -hmm. it would be actually better for the economy if you actually mm -hmm. bought two jackets, three jackets. Because guess what? Your spending is someone else's income. Yep. Yep. So like, in order to have a better economy, we actually want more people to be spending because that's only 70% of the economy. So that's why I think something I think about is that a lot of the problems that we have are not necessarily because we know the we don't know the solution, is because we have a problem of incentives. Mm -hmm. How do we how, how do we actually align incentives so that we actually have good things? Like we solve climate change and we don't have, you know, things like consumerism where it's been proven that people literally just go buy more stuff to feel better about themselves. Mm -hmm. 
What does like what does it say about our culture? Like what does it say about the the, the country? And say what you say, it says something because people might be looking for something. And as much as you want to buy the whole thing, buy Amazon from you know Jeff Bezos if you want. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna find it. Mm -hmm. So it's it's interesting because I think that whoever is able to figure out how to align centers at a large scale, that person will be probably the richest person in the world mm -hmm. and the most, you know, like normal prices and everything. Who knows? But uh, it, it's, it's interesting. It's it's funny that you brought that up. I had this discussion with um, with one of my roommates just the other night. We were talking about, you know, economics. He's, he's far more well-versed in this than I am. Um, but one of the things that he brought up that I didn't, I didn't know was that, um, I guess in economic circles, you know, GDP is brought up as not a super great way to measure the health of an economy. Um, and I guess another misconception is that economics is just concerned with money. But in many ways, it's a more general social science that can be used to, I guess, assess the, the health of a society at whole. And so he was talking about, you know, various ways that you could, you know, different metrics that you could use to better measure an economy. And it really opened my eyes to the idea that, um, you know, statistics aren't just something that you use after the fact to look back on what you've done, but statistics tend to drive the way that you live. Um, because if you want to, you know, you know, there's, I guess, uh, another current trend I've seen in like public education is like, you know, setting smart goals. I remember <laughs> past couple of years of high school, I had to go to the counselor every year and we had to set like smart goals. I thought it was hogwash. Um, but it is important because the way that you set a goal and the way that you determine you'll measure it will vastly change the way that you go after achieving that goal. Um, and so, yeah, I, th I thought it was very interesting that, you know, maybe it's not that people are, you know, intentionally doing things to destroy society and destroy the economy, but the goal that they're chasing just is the wrong goal. Um, and they, they don't see it. So... Yeah, I think it's interesting that you bring that up. Yeah, and, and the question would be like, how do we get these people to get more skin in the game and like see like what like what mm -hmm. they're actually doing? Like, I mean, like clothing is a huge thing. Like, people, like use it like jackets. It's like clothing actually creates a huge amount of like pollution because like where it comes from and like like the whole supply chain is like a little interesting there. But like I don't know, like that question itself, it, it's it's very very interesting. I think we're we're going to try to get some economists mm -hmm. on the show to see anything that were interesting that we find. Yeah, it's it's funny. I was doing a mini project for, for ME200. If you're watching this, Professor Liebenberg, please give me an A in your class. <laughs> um, and one of the questions I had to answer was on, you know, what would I do if I were running a startup to ensure sustainability? And one of the first things that came to mind was Patagonia. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys know Patagonia, the, the outwear, outerwear brand. Um, funnily enough, the guy that started Patagonia and the guy that started North Face were both best buddies. They went on a lot of climbing expeditions. Um, but when they saw the environmental impact of the clothing industry, they took vastly different paths. The, the founder of North Face said he, he didn't want to have anything to do with this, uh, I guess, environmental catastrophe that he saw coming. Whereas the founder of Patagonia decided he wanted to stay in his company and try and direct them um, to not follow the paths of all the other you know, larger companies and just sell people things that they don't need. Um, but instead, you know, kind of change the culture. And so I found this statistic, I think it was 2015. I'm probably wrong with the year, but Patagonia ran a full page ad in the New York Times on Black Friday, or I, I guess a few days before. And the ad had a picture of one of their jackets. And in big, bold text, it said, don't buy this jacket. And, you know, the message of the ad was don't buy things that you don't need. Um, and so in Patagonia's, you know, attempt to, to kind of curb consumerism, they just fueled it more. And I think it was a great ad. I think it was a really right. cool thing to see a company do. But the next year, their sales, their sales rose by 30%. Um, maybe you could argue that they saw that coming and that was part of the ad. Um, you could also say that they genuinely did want to put a dent in consumerism. But regardless of their incentives or regardless of their intent, you know, their, their attempt to kind of help, you know, curb consumerism may have fueled it more. Um, 
And I'm sure there's some oversight in my analysis on that, but I just thought it was really interesting. Yeah, it, it, one thing. It's, I think one thing is really a part of like being a human. Like mm -hmm. one thing thinks. Like, you know, some people say, you know, in Buddhism, they say, desire is suffering. And, and you know, mm -hmm. suffering is part of life because we're, all, we're always desiring what, what other people like wants. There was this um, uh, guy at Stanford, his name was Rene Girard. And he developed this theory called mimetic theory. And basically, the one sentence here, the one liner here, is that we want what other people want. Hmm. And this actually has like huge effects in like war, peace, the world. And just that, like we want what other people want. And these, like this, like piece of like belief or like evidence that you found, interestingly enough, has been actually used by many of like, like Facebook, for example. So Facebook actually, like one of the things, so like one of the board members, actually Peter Thiel, and Peter Thiel was the first investor in Facebook. And this guy actually was like bodies with this guy from Stanford. Yeah. So, and one of the things that you can see in like in an action is that, let's say you were scrolling down through Instagram and you see, oh, it was like, like this guy. Oh, it must be good. So I'm going to like it too. I'm going to like it too. Hmm. Or like, the other thing they did in Instagram was really interesting too, is that they have you follow this person, and then he says like thirty other people follow this person too. Mm. Just by that, you're more likely to to follow that. Yeah. So that that, that that was a long conversation there, but one thing what other people want. So if I could give you anything, if I could give you anything, if you could have anything in life, maybe besides besides money, because money. Would be relevant after if I, if I, if 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 you get if you ask, if you ask the right thing, but if you can be guaranteed anything in life, what would you what would you get? Hmm. Hmm. Tricky question. A new bike, a new team jacket. No, I'm just kidding. Another um, one. <laughs> maybe four more. Right. I don't know. Um, that's a good question. Um, and you know, thinking that we want what other people want. Hmm. Giving you that, that assumption okay. there. Okay, you're trying to prompt me a little. Um, let's see. So I, I heard this quote, and I think it's something that I, I pretty firmly believe in. Uh, when the quote reads, like, everybody's searching for, or everyone has a God-shaped void in their heart. Um, you know, maybe you don't want to use the word God. That's fair, but... I think everybody's searching for something very deep and everybody ideally is searching for truth. Um, and so I guess my, my hope would be that people would find that not necessarily the answers they want to hear. Maybe I'm horribly wrong with my, my assessment on God, faith, et cetera. But I, I pray that people would find, you know, the truth that they're looking for. Um, you know, if you wake me up really early in the morning and you ask me this question without so much thought, maybe I won't give you the answer. That's maybe I'll tell you I want a new bike this summer because I do want a new bike. Okay. Um, but yeah, if I can really think about it, that, that is one thing that I would say would be pretty cool to see. So you would give it to not anything about you for yourself, for other people, actually. Okay. Don't, don't make me sound like Mother Teresa. <laughs> there are a lot of things I want. All right. All right. Um, I could use a new camera. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, a lot of things, but that's that's one thing I've thought about. Yeah, but you know, going back to that question, actually, something interesting about you too, about many things, is that you're just happy, and because you're happy, you just pursue these obsessions and everything. And I think what you have is like this joy or like this. Perhaps you have you have many worries. I would say I don't know that, but you're just happy to be alive. Like you sure you may have homework and you may have that and you know, maybe some mm -hmm. tam, which is horrible, whatever. But just joyful, like just living. And I think that I don't know the answer, obviously, but maybe it has to do with what you said. Because maybe you found your truth. Is it true or not? It depends on what you ask. And, and, and for you, which is probably what matters the most, is that you believe it's, it's, it's true. It's, it's mm -hmm. true. And because of that, I think you just. That drives your life in such way. Is that is that accurate? I would say that's an accurate depiction. I, I would say 
my faith in God brings me a lot of peace and a lot of joy. I mean, that being said, you know, I, I do have my breaking points. Like last night was a rough night. Bombed an ECE quiz, struggled with some homework, and I felt like, dang, maybe I'm too stupid to be an engineer in the Granger College of Engineering. Um, and it, it was a little bit of a rough night. I just yeah, felt yeah. really, you know, kind of down. But, you know, another day is, is another day, and today has been much better. Didn't get as much work as I would like to get done, but, um, you know, here I am talking to a good friend. What's your time now? Had some good mac and cheese <laughs> earlier, you know? It was really good. So, um, I can assess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, now, you know, that's, you know, a, a more fun one. So imagine you are, for some reason, you couldn't go back to, you couldn't go back to Houston. Your parents went back to see some, some folks at a Barbados. Mm-hmm. And you know, back, you couldn't go back to Houston, but you know, someone invited you for their Thanksgiving uh, dinner. So imagine you are these friends, or maybe, okay. or maybe even girlfriend. Who knows? <laughs> so you're at their house, and you're about to eat. You're super hungry because you because you were living by yourself. You were too lazy to make some breakfast, and you're really really hungry. It's four o'clock. You're really hungry, and you, you know, you did the, like, oh, I, I'm thankful for this and that, whatever. And you're ready to eat. <laughs> you're ready to eat. You have the turkey and you have the salad. You grab your fork. Get on the salad. You move a little bit. Mistake. I would not go for the salad, but continue. <laughs> okay. Okay. What would you go for? Then? <laughs> some nice, some nice mac and cheese. Okay. Honey baked ham. So, and, and, the, and the mac and cheese, they use a little thick. So, like, stuff could be inside. So... <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Okay, okay. So you're opening the thing. So you, you got the first one. Oh, delicious. You got the second one. You bite it, and there's something in there. You pull it out, it's a like cockroach. What would you do? What would I do? You want my real answer or my nice answer? Give me both. Give me both. I don't know, honestly. <laughs> that's a that's a hard question to answer. I think I'd probably like scream. I'd probably <laughs> spit it out. Um, okay, but like, how about their family? They're like, are you really gonna spit out like the food like that? Yeah, I'd like to give them a warning so they're not poisoned. What if maybe <laughs> someone sprayed like raid, you know, you know, you know, ant spray or something? Okay, but what it's if poison? What if it's part of a culture or something? Part of the culture. Yeah, it's not a culture I'm a part of. I'm sorry, <laughs> but <laughs> part of my culture is not liking cockroaches. All right, is that fair? Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. I think that's fair. Okay, so you, you scream and what now? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know what you do after that. It would depend on their reaction. Okay, know? but the family's really pissed at you now. Well, it depends, right? Is it's the like, cockroach in there by the accident or is it part of the dish? I think I think it was an accident. It was well, I mean, an, an accident, but like the cockroach was really enjoying the mac and cheese. So in, if, you, if you look at it from that it way. It was alive. Of course. Have you ever seen Fear Factor one, David? I'm not sure what that is. Well, it's this this game show. I'm sure some people in the audience have seen Fear Factor. But it's where people hopefully get paid a lot of money. They do some crazy things, like right. eat cockroaches or, you know, be in a bed of snakes. They get paid a lot of money. So I think I'd want to go home with a, you know, a nice Christmas check, a nice Thanksgiving check <laughs> uh, for my troubles. So you were suing them. Oh, what else would Americans do? Okay, fair enough, fair enough. What would a an, an Indonesian uh, Jaden would do? An Indonesian Jaden? I don't know. I don't think I would have made it to the dinner because of traffic. So okay. <laughs> probably be okay, a good answer. Good answer. Indonesia has this. Uh, it's, it's actually a startup from Jakarta called Gojek, and you know it's. I guess here you would assume it's very similar to like Uber or like DoorDash, but Gojek is fantastic. It's like a motorcycle taxi, brings food. You can get go massage. You can get like a go barber. You can get like go cleaning. So I'd probably stay home or maybe after I got home from the Thanksgiving dinner and, okay. and go check a whole ton of food. And then when you got home with some nice you know, food, you get your phone and then you get a text from your friend or, or girlfriend or whoever. Hey, I'm sorry about that. Are you still friends with the person? You know, sure. Cause, you know, it's, it's just a cockroach at the end of the day. <laughs> I don't know. It, it would depend on how intentional I felt it was. Okay. You know, maybe no, someone no, in the family was sending a message. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, maybe, maybe. A message. 
That's it. That's a story for I mean, another day. I, I, think, I, think they, I think they do have a lot of pros in the show. Maybe it's a good message. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I do have a, a video game for Xbox 360. Um, you know, Man vs. Wild? Uh, sure. No. <laughs> but, okay. It's this TV show where this guy, Bear Grylls, would, you know, supposedly get thrown in, like, the middle of a forest or something. And all right. He'd eat all kinds of craziness. And I did play the video game, so maybe I should be prepared for that. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. All right, the last two things and, and two questions, and, and this are, are, are fun. So the first one we're going to play is that we have, I'm going to ask you, I want to say a couple of things, and and the, the prompt is basically overrated or underrated. Okay. Ready? All right. The union. The union, the university yeah, union? No, yeah, yeah. Well, not union. Tricky. Tricky. I'm going to go with underrated. Underrated. It's, it's a nice study spot. Um, pro tip for you incoming freshmen, those of you guys that are panicking on if you're going to get into CS and you're probably scarring the UIUC Reddit. If you do get in beginning of the year, go to the Illini Union bookstore and get a bunch of those coupon packets. They have like two bucks off for like a, a pizza from Blaze Pizza. So I think that's a little underrated student hack. I think I, I didn't know that. So yeah, there you know. <laughs> I have some in my backpack just for when I feel a little special. Oh, for me or for no? Me? Oh, okay, oh, okay. You sure? Okay, okay. All right. Mechanical and or engineering in general, overrated or underrated? I'm gonna go with overrated. Overrated. Not okay. because engineering is bad, but I think that there's a stigma that like if you make it into engineering, you're like you're like that guy. You're a genius. But if you walk, you know, okay, people come on tours and they they see the Granger College of Engineering. Like someone from Granger is probably watching this. You know, I, I hope I don't disqualify myself from scholarships. It's okay. But, you know, they see all the nice buildings and they're like, wow, this is great. I'm going to walk out of here. I'm going to make six figure starting salary. Um, but you don't think about all the times you're going to have to walk into Granger Library or the DCO and you're going to sit in a CBTF exam with 80 <laughs> other engineers who all were that guy from high school or that girl from high school and are all crying. You know, because they just bomb some midterm and they feel like they're too stupid. Um, there's a lot of sucky parts about engineering. And so if you're coming into it just because of how well it's rated and you think you're going to make a lot of money and you're going to have a lot of prestige, that's a big mistake. Just like people that go to med school and go through all those years just for a salary. If you're doing it because of how well it's rated, you're not an idiot, but you're an idiot. Um, okay. You better like <laughs> engineering to some degree if right. you're going to stick with it. Um and, you know, also as engineers, sometimes it's kind of fun. You know, we hate on other majors. Like, oh, they have so little homework. Um, no, I'm getting, oh, I'm getting you know, it. So. Artists don't do anything. Yeah. But, you know, it's like 3 a.m. We're tired. And what do we do? We go on Spotify. And we put on some beautiful music by someone that didn't have to go through CBTF exams and probably lives in L.A. and was relaxing on the beach when they wrote this song. And as we're crying, we're listening to their music okay. while we bully their fellow majors. So... It's a bit overrated for for those aforementioned reasons. Yeah, and you know, I think it's actually really really interesting because people think, oh, engineering it means six figures. And just to break it to you, if you look at the data here, most engineering majors don't have the demand. So a lot of people, sure, you're gonna get the, the engineering degree, but demand isn't there. Mm -hmm. And supply and demand. And actually, I think the only one that has actually demand for like jobs, actually computer science. Or it doesn't, it doesn't mean you should do computer science or mm. like has a demand or whatever, but you're just like, sure, you're going through this pain and whatever. whatever. Like you, the only reason why you should do it is because you like it. Mm -hmm. If you like it, sure, you'll find a job and like everything will work out. But if you're doing it for the money or for like overrated, yeah, at first the demand is in there and like, sure, you're going to be so smart, but like. You might not even like what you're doing every day. <laughs> and I guess, you know, there are times, maybe I shouldn't say you're an idiot if you go into this for the money. You know, there are people that you know, probably have rough home situations and they just need a stable job that's going to get the money. But again, it's still overrated because yeah, you might make money. It might help your situation, but you have to be aware that like you might find it really boring or, or not even so much engineering. Maybe it's the, the big majors. Like, um, I think parts of CS are super cool, but I know it's something that I couldn't enjoy doing, even though I might write a little snippet of code and think like, I'm that guy. Um, you know, and, and people overlook other smaller majors within engineering and think like they're, 
you know, kind of like old school or, or they're just too niche. Um, things like systems and industrial, um, sometimes civil, I think it's overlooked. There are kind of a lot of cool majors that may really be the right one for you. Um, don't just go to the, the popular ones like Mechie and ECE and CS, unless you really like that stuff. We want what other people want. So if you're able to like, when you're thinking, oh, I want to do mechanical engineering, is it because I really want it or because other people want mm -hmm. me to do or like whatever. So interesting. Since you, you talk a lot about other majors, the other one that is popular here is business majors. Underrated or overrated? Business majors, I'm going to say underrated. Underrated. Um, yeah. I'd say, you know, technical majors are really, really important. But at the end of the day, no matter what you're doing, you need some business sense if you want to profit off of it. Um, Maybe. And so they get a lot of hate sometimes. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a useful measure. There are a lot of business majors that do want to learn the technical things. Um, and, you know, I guess some of the reason, you know, business majors might get that hate is you know, the stereotype that, you know, you're, you're some CS kid grinding away. You have some great new startup idea and some business major comes along and says, hey, I've got this better idea. Can you code this for me? And, you know, there's the assumption that they don't know anything about the product. They don't know anything about the technology. They just want to, you know, take the engineers, you know, get their work and sell it. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of times the business part of, of anything is, is easily overlooked. So. You know, again, Illini Motorsports, any of the other car teams on campus, any of the other, you know, engineering clubs like aerobotics, um, any of the other clubs like climbing club or like recycling club, they all do cool things and provide value to people. But there's a lot of like tedious, overlooked work that is crucial to them functioning. So for all those like, you know, big technical clubs, we need a lot of money to build a car or to build a robot or, you know, to, to, you know, build something, whether it's one of the big civil clubs or something. Um, and so no matter how many intelligent engineers you have, you need people that are going to reach out to sponsors that are going to um, help recruit members that are going to help to do all those other important things. Um, and so, yeah, I'd say business is a little bit underrated because currently all the hype is on, you know, everything technology, but that's not for everyone. Fair enough, fair enough. All right. Thank you so much, Aiden, for, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, my pleasure. But um, having you on the show really shows that if you follow your obsessions and if you do what you want to do, everything will work out. And mm -hmm. that way you will find things that you want to do. Like like now you're really into rock climbing and probably you're going to be in, in a few weeks, you're going to really be into tag, you know, like professional tag or whatever. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something mm -hmm. good and something you don't see because every time, everyone is doing something because of something. Yep. And very few people I've seen that they're doing something because of that. Really. Mm -hmm. uh, as simple as that. But Thank you. Have yeah. One last word. Yeah, you know? go for it. You know, there's some people that have, you know, maybe you're driving and you're listening to the podcast and you wish you could see our beautiful faces, but you really wish you could see these right here, <laughs> sparkling water. And so... We spoke a lot about obsessions. One that's dear to my heart is drinking San Pellegrinos. San Pellegrino, if you're watching, sponsor the show. Um, there are a lot of UIC <laughs> engineers that would love to work for you. You just got to send me a drink. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much, and I hope to see you next time. <laughs>